I recently started using PETG in my 3D printing with my Prusa Mark 3S. And initially I ran into a lot of problems that I'm sure some of you have experienced yourselves. I wanted to kind of go through the steps I went through to resolve those problems and where I'm at now in the printing process. I started off, I was designing these, what I think are pretty cool orchid pots. And when I first started printing them, I was using PLA, which is polylactic acid, I believe. <laughs> it's cornstarch based material. It's super easy to work with. It's one of the more, more common things that you use in 3D printing. You can do a bunch of different cool materials like wood infills, metal infills, carbon fiber, things like that. So it's really flexible. The downsides to it are that it has a fairly low melting point. So if you have stuff that's gonna be out in the sun or needs to be inside of a hot car, for example, it might melt or warp. Uh, it also discolors over time in the sun. For my specific use case, since I'm building orchid pots that need to be in warm places, moisture, sun, things like that, I wanted something that would hold its shape and uh, not degrade over time as much as possible. So in comes PETG, which stands for polyethylene terephthalate with a glycol modifier. Yeah. I don't know why I don't remember that. It just rolls off the tongue. So PETG is often used in water bottles, plastic bottles for stuff. So it's cool because it's usually food safe. It uh, can be semi-transparent, which you can't really get out of PLA. It also has a much higher melting point and it's typically less brittle, I'll say typically less brittle than PLA. And we'll talk about why that last part is kind of important here. So I started printing with it and it's a little bit different. You have higher printing temperatures, 230 to 250 degrees Celsius. You have a higher bed temp, usually, you know, 70 to, I've seen people go up to 110 degrees Celsius. It also sticks a lot more. So if you have a brass nozzle on your printer, the PETG can actually stick to the nozzle and it causes globbing. I'll show you how to get up, get over that. Um, the first layer is typically a little bit thicker, so you need to go a little bit higher on your z-axis to get that nice first layer. And just a few other random things like that. And if you don't get all of that right, what ends up happening is what you see over here, this big pile of mistakes. <laughs> the pile of sadness, as I like to call it. Uh, this is an example of one. So this is one of the water bases. Actually, this is the orchid pot itself. I can't even tell because it's so mangled. You can see this, this bottom infill piece, there wasn't very good adhesion there on this bridge. And also it's super brittle. Like I could probably, yeah, check that out. I just popped through it and I bet it, this will just rip right off. So it's just shattering. And you can tell like the layer adhesion is just awful. And so when my first couple prints came out like this, Here's another example I did with a, a transparent pet G. And again, it just, I mean, it's super brittle. It just falls apart and crumbles. So when I did this, I was like, what the heck? I thought PETG was supposed to be this more flexible, durable thing that I was gonna have all these magical properties that would help with my orchid pots, but it didn't seem to be the case. These are the, the water trays. After manufacturing, I was like, all right, cool. So I'll do a couple flex tests because customers are gonna, you know, they'll, there you go. They'll pop things and test it out. But um, just how brittle that is, is insane. And these rings, these outer rings just snap right off and they just shatter. Uh, there's almost no flex to them. They're just brittle, brittle, brittle. That sucks. So I, I was on a mission. You can see these imperfections in the first layer. And then on the top infill layers, it was actually, this is with three layers of infill and you can still see the, hopefully you can see that on the camera, but you can still see the infill underneath with three layers on top of it. So that was garbage. I hated it. So how do we get from that to this? This has a little bit of water in it still because I was testing it. You can see this, this first layer, flawless. I mean, this is, this is literally the best first layer I've printed out of any material. Also the top layer, I mean, it's just completely, absolutely flawless. Um, it's also, see, I'm flexing it like pretty hard and it's flexible. This is what I want. So how did I get from that brittle crap 
to this. The first thing I did is really spend some time tuning the Z axis on the machine. Typically I was at 1.04 for PLA. Um, so I was pretty close to the bed. I had to, I had it moved down quite a bit. So it smushed that first layer. And so I moved this down to, well, actually let's check it. Let's see what the live Z is. Oh, actually it won't do it since we're not on the first layer anymore. But I think it's, it's around 0.8. So it's significantly higher than it was before. And I'll show you some stuff in Slicer that made all of the difference in the world. All right, let's take a look at these Slicer settings. Now, the first thing I should mention is that I'm using Amazon Basics Pet-G. For my PLA, I was using Prusament, which I think is absolutely fantastic. And I had heard some good things about Amazon Basics Pet-G. And after getting it tuned and set up right, I think I'm pretty happy with it. So the first thing I did is in Slicer, I went and I selected generic PET. That's as my, my base profile that I used for this whole thing. And then I went in and I turned on for configuration preferences. I turned on advanced mode so that I could go in and modify some of the really advanced settings for each thing. So I'm printing at 0.3 millimeter, which is the draft Mark III profile by default but I have modified some things. So for the first print layer, I do that at 0.3 millimeters as well. And I think just laying down a slightly thicker layer of PET G across the bottom on the first layer, it really just helps with um, not only adhesion, but getting down a nice base layer that everything else can stick to. Over the, the quality, which slows down the speed of your slicing, but really that doesn't matter much to me. Um, I selected a few things, avoid crossing perimeters, this just helps to prevent some of the oozing and stringing that you see sometimes with uh, some of the PET-G. Detect thin walls, detect bridging perimeters. This just helps with the flow when you're doing an overhang and allows it to enable the fan appropriately. One of the big things though is I did enable under seam position, by default it's nearest, which what that means is it, it takes the, the seam and it puts it to the nearest starting point to where the original seam was. And so you end up with this line. And let me kind of show you what I mean. Here's my first couple prints that had seaming set to nearest. And you can see there's this seam that's kind of jagged across the top of here. And then you can also see it vertically on here. Now what I did is I changed it from uh, nearest over to random. And if you look at this one, there's absolutely no seam anywhere. And the reason for that is that every time it lays down a new layer, it picks a random starting point. And so you get that, that one kind of uniform line scattered throughout the entire print on every single layer. So you don't really get that same look. For what I'm building here, this works the best, uh, but you need to check out some, some different things here. Like, if you have something that has a sharp corner or an inner corner, it can hide the seam inside of there, depending on the setting you use. For infill, I selected infill only where needed. Uh, I don't think I really changed anything else here other than I'm using grid for the fill pattern. And then speed. So for the, the first layer speed, I dropped that down to 20, although I think I might be able to bump that back up a little bit. The acceleration I stuck, it's still at a, a thousand millimeters per second, so that hasn't really changed. But given how perfect my first layer is, maybe I'll just stick with this, but I think I could bump this back up to like 25, 30, maybe even higher, I don't know. Under filament settings, so here's where I made a few different changes. So for the first layer, I'm doing 230 degrees Celsius, and then for the bed, I'm doing 95. PETG likes to stick to the bed, and so if you have a hotter bed, it's gonna stick even better. So for that adhesion, I, I bump it up to 95. And then for all the other layers, I drop it down to 90 and I raise the extrusion temperature to 235. Like I said, so far that seems to work really well. For cooling, I actually made quite a few changes here that I think helped. So keep fan always on, I unchecked. So I left that off. I enabled the auto cooling, and this is where the system kind of automatically, depending on how long a layer is gonna take, or if it's a bridging layer, et cetera, et cetera, it will change the fan speed. And then on the fan speed settings, I had this at 30% uh, minimum and 50% maximum, but I dropped the minimum down to zero because there are some cases where 
you just don't need to run the fan. And if it doesn't need to be run, it doesn't need to run. For bridges, I put that at 50%, but that seems to be fine. And then I disabled the fan for the first three layers. I don't think I changed anything on here, uh, but for the filament overrides, and honestly, I think this probably had the biggest impact on how this whole thing works, is I did retract on layer change and wipe while retracting. With PETG, what typically happens when you're printing is it goes back and forth across all the lines and it's continuously extruding. What ends up happening is you get globs that attract to the brass nozzle, it gets stuck there, and then you get these every few layers or every once in a while you get this big glob of PETG that just sticks to the middle of a layer. Your next layer goes over it and you've got these weird lumps and bumps and it's just an ugly mess. So by retracting between layers, what it does is it sucks the filament up, retracts it out of the nozzle slightly between layers, and then it pushes it back down. That's so you don't get oozing between those two layers. And then the wipe just, again, it's another setting that helps with that to prevent that oozing in those globs when you're doing the additional layers. And as you can see, this just finished printing while we were over there talking about the settings. So I'm gonna pop this off. And again, there are no globs, and it's pretty darn perfect. I mean, it's a great looking model. It's good flexibility. It doesn't feel like the whole thing's just gonna fall apart anytime there's an issue, and that's, Really what we're after, right?